So, hey everyone, uh, welcome to our little lecture, part three, where we talk about chapter nine, which is schools and delinquency. And so, uh, obviously, if you didn't pick up from the early hints from before, um, if you remember, our impact on delinquents starts with the family, because that is where you're born into and what you deal with for the most part. And then you get into your peers. And well, the question is, where do your peers come from? And that is school. School, daycare, programs, gangs, whatever it may be. School is where most juveniles get in touch with their peer groups, whether it expands outward, outward in a different way or not. But this is where it comes in. And so because of this nature, because we talked about the impact of peers especially on uh, young adults and teenagers, um, truly, and this is more than just school itself as well, and I'll talk about it in a second, not educational. <sighs> I don't know why, but my brain had a brain fart when I was doing that, so apologies there. Um, but education in America is a huge factor. So, real quick, the reason why education in America is a huge factor, so not only are schools the ways in which peers are introduced to individuals and that, that in fact has an impact on them, the other thing is the growing gap. So, okay, so the growing gap in success and pick your insert, gender, race, religion, cultural identity, sexuality, um, whatever the gap is, uh, for the most part, what we tend to see a lot of times in regards to uh, criminality and juvenile delinquency, race is the big one. Obviously, the other ones can play a large impact on it, but the growing gap in success and race of student has a huge impact on juvenile delinquency. As we see a gap between success and race, so, you know, the unfortunate reality of if you are white, the chances of you being successful in education is, is significantly higher than if you are of another race. Like, that is an issue. That has a huge factor in delinquency rates. Um, so, really, this... This is why I say education is not just the school giving access to peers, but it's the impact that the school has on a student. Um, we tend to not think about this kind of stuff, but um, even within like a, a mixed school setting, uh, discipline is not equal. Um, there is data, and our textbook does bring it out, but... Um, Typically, minority students are punished harsher than their white peers. And that's not okay. That's clear bias and discrimination, but that leads to more in that growing gap between success and race. And so this does make a difference. And... If you are in my class today and listening and watching, and uh, this is where I tell you, unfortunately, and if you're here, you probably know this as a fact as well. Um, education does impact 
your social status. If you are here taking classes, trying to get a better or different job, you are living to this fact that education impacts your social status. You are trying to get an education so that you can get a better job, so you can do better in your life. Dropping out hurts you. Education plays a huge impact on your life. If you are a returning adult student who dropped out of high school, I'm sure you may not want to admit it and you might hate the fact that you're like, damn, he's right, or damn, I wish that adult that told me this when I was younger, I would have listened to them. It makes a difference on your life. And yeah, I'm all high and mighty with my degrees and saying, well, education is important and you need this. I'm not saying everyone needs a college education. I'm not saying everyone needs a master's. I'm not saying everyone needs a bachelor's. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the reality is our society requires education. You need to have a level of education to have any kind of real status in our society. Even those super rich billionaires that dropped out of college, guess what? They went to college. They went to college, took classes, and said, yeah, this is beneath me. They went to high school. They went to good high schools. Like, You can't tell me education had no impact on their life. Education had a big impact on their life. They also just found a different path that worked for them, but it was part of it. Education is important. And so if you're here, if you're listening, and you plan on you're in the program and you actually are trying to get a degree, you know this is true. And so I hate that it's true. I really do. So that being said, this is why school has an impact on juvenile delinquency. It's not just because they introduce their peers, but if they don't get a good education, if they are not able to finish their education, if they are being treated unfairly, if they are not being allowed to finish that is going to impact their social status. That's going to show them that nothing will matter. And that's going to encourage them to go into a life of crime, go into a life of delinquency. Schools have an impact. Whether they want to admit it or not, they have a big impact. So, yeah. Like I said, it, this is my own little soapbox area because I do have a degree in education and I care about this stuff, but... It's really unfortunate. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to ask you a education major question. And from, I'd be interested to hear the criminal justice uh, student aspect. And I'd also be interested to find out you, if you're not interested in this, what your thought is. Is it right to track students by ability or achievement level. And so our text even mentions this kind of question, but uh, just to emphasize, tracking a student means that uh, they put them in particular classes uh, so that they are on the track to college. They're on the track to a job. Is it right to track students based off of their ability or achievement level? I'm interested to know. That actually might be part of the discussion board question. So I'm just putting it out there. I want you to think about it. I want you to mull it over a little bit. But now I get to also put forward this question as far as education and schools. Um, is it 
Let's talk about bullying real quick. So, bullying, straightforward, is a form of abuse. Period. It's not done by a parent. It's done by a peer. But bullying is abuse. Just want to put that out there right off the way. Um, but what's interesting is bullies have a history. Specifically of anti-social behaviors. And I just want to uh, also mention that school shooters also have a history of antisocial behaviors. Just putting it out there as a weird kind of connection piece. But, so, bullying in particular, and the whole reason why I'm just kind of bringing it up in general. So, bullying itself is problematic. Um, partly because these are, like I said, peer-to-peer -peer abuse. And typically... Um, Data that we have on this is that bullying is a problem. It is widespread. It is part of an imbalance in power. Um, there is evidence that shows that there is a link between bullying and suicide. Um, but we also see that uh, individuals with the history of antisocial behaviors that become bullies. Um, we also see that these individuals sometimes also uh, have some of the other qualifications that would put them on a life of delinquency. Bullying is a delinquent act. Choosing to abuse another individual. Bullying is not right. Plain and simple. It's really wanna, what I want to say about that. Um, But so I put school shooters up there, and so I'm going to say a uh, slight warning. I'm going to talk about school shooting uh, here just real quickly because I don't want to dive too deep into this. It is a hard subject to talk about, um, especially since some individuals who do this are not okay, and I mean like uh, one case is brought up in our textbook, specifically T.J. Lane uh, with the uh, Chardon High School in 2012 in Ohio. The response that he has in court really bothers me, so I'm not going to dive into it too much, but um, it's my job to talk about this stuff. So um, the reason I draw a line between bullying as abuse Bullies have a history of antisocial behaviors and school shooters are also connected with antisocial behaviors is that while, yes, we tend to show some kind of uh, connection or uh, victimization with some school shooters as, well, they were subject to bullying. Well, that's fair. They might have been, but their response was in a similar way, bullying. And so there is this kind of interesting and i don't mean like oh that's cool i mean like there's a weird kind of connection that they have um but our textbook puts forward about five percent of students in grades 9 through 12 report bringing weapons to school on a regular basis that might not seem like a whole lot but our textbook says consider that there are about 15 million students in high school at the moment at the moment that means about seven hundred fifty thousand armed students enter school buildings on a routine basis. That's a terrifying number. That is a lot of people. Um, so yeah, when we say 5%, oh, that's nothing. 5% is nothing, but 750,000 is a lot. Um, so uh, as I kind of said, our textbook brings it. So who brings guns to school? 
Research finds a link between shootings and a history of being bullied by other students. Um, and so they do mention uh, the famous 1999 Columbine High School shooting. Um, specifically, one reason for their deadly action was feelings of being bullied and ostracized by more popular students. Um, they had spent more than a year planning the attack and building homemade bombs. So social outsiders who perceive a lack of support from peers, parents, and teachers, you know, have access to guns make for an explosive situation. Um, this is an important piece regarding school shooters that I do want to emphasize and people tend to forget because we get so emotional in the moment. The research and the data shows us the U.S. Secret Service developed a profile for school shooters. They found that, well, first off, it's hard to profile a school shooter because there's not like a typical gender. Well, there, there is, but there's not like typical things. What they do find is that most attacks were neither spontaneous nor impulsive. The reality is, in three-fourths of the cases, threats were communicated to people. Like, these aren't things that just happen out of the blue. People plan this. School shootings are not, wake up one morning, I'm going to do this. It's thought out at least two days sometimes multiple years. So this is intent. This is thought. This is development. This is this is not just a oh momentary moment. This is a long running problem. Um yeah. And our text also puts forward shooters, school shooters had a history of feeling extremely depressed or desperate. About three-fourths of the shooters either threatened to kill themselves, made suicidal gestures, or tried to kill themselves before the attack. Six students killed themselves during the incident. Most frequent motivation was revenge. Bullying can lead to school shooters. School shooters are not just impulsive. They are well-developed, well-thought-out. And so I guess the question that kind of loops back in is, well, how the heck do we stop bullying? And so this is where I say, you know, if you went to school in the last 25 years, you probably are familiar with some anti-bullying campaign that was pushed around at your school, your middle school and your high school and probably your grade school as well. Like, oh, hey, don't bully each other and all these other things. Do those programs work? There's debates on that. But um, so according to Ken Seeley, Martin Tumbari, Lori Bennett and Jason Dunkel, uh, this is all found on page 252 of our textbook. Uh, they did actually put following measures that can help stop bullying. Notice, they did not say that they will stop bullying, but they can help reduce that number. Um, so clearly, you know, increased student engagement more than just, you know, if you see someone bullying, tell on them. No, like actually in involving students, uh, model caring behaviors for students, not just saying don't bully, like show them what to do, uh, offer mentoring programs for potential bullies so, you know, they have a positive outlet. Uh, provide students with opportunities for service learning as a means of improving school engagement. Address the difficult transition from elementary to middle school, from a single classroom teacher to teams of teachers. Uh, also, you know, change from middle school to high school, things like that. Uh, start prevention programs early and resist the temptation to use prefabricated curricula that are not aligned to local conditions. And that's a lot of fancy education words and let me tell you what that means if you don't know don't use a preset program that's designed for one thing no use something that matters to your particular group if you know that your students are particularly using facebook or tumblr or tiktok or snapchat to bully Get into a program that talks about that and cyberbullying. Don't do one that says, oh, hey, if the person puts you in a locker, you should say, no, 
If they're not using a locker, then the, the entire program is pointless. Use something that's made for you or make something that is for you. And so, uh, one other thing before I kind of go really any deeper, I'm not going to uh, write them down because it's way too much, but I will write down on page 255. There is a giant list. It is the entire page. It's Exhibit 9.2, Factors Linked to School Violence. And so this is just a uh, from the CDC, Understanding School Violence from 2015. It's a list of uh, potential risk factors and things like that, that if you notice this, it might uh, be a heads up to potential school violence, whether that be increase in bullying or it means uh, potential school shooting. But these are things to look for. So like uh, social withdrawal, excessive feelings of isolation, excessive feelings of rejection, being a victim of violence, feelings of being picked on and persecuted, low school interest and poor academic performance, preferred lifestyle changes, expression of violence in writings and drawings, uncontrolled anger. Like these things, if you start seeing these, guess what? probably going to lead to something so you have to kind of break into this and think about it um and so it's a terrible transition and segue but uh, that do does get into the concept of zero tolerance policies um and you might have heard these before but if not a zero tolerance policy is some kind of mandate that says specific consequences or punishments for acts uh and not allowed to anyone to avoid those consequences. So uh, if you have a zero tolerance policy on bullying, that means if someone is caught bullying, their crime is punishable by this. There's no middle ground. There's no, well, what about, nope, you did it, you do this. That's a zero tolerance policy. The question is, does it work? And I'm going to leave that out to you only because I think it's... Uh, more fun to pose what if questions, uh, especially when there are things like that, because I think it's interesting for you to critically think, because that's part of college. But <clears throat> um, as far as, you know, making schools more efficient, as far as uh, delinquency prevention, uh, they do put forward a couple ideas, like um, some of the most prevalent strategies are cognitive strategies, where they Increase students' awarenesses about the dangers of drug abuse and delinquency. Uh, affective strategies where they improve students' psychological assets and self-image to give them the resources to resist antisocial behavior. So, you know, you encourage them to see the positive in themselves rather than see the negative. Behavioral strategies like training students and techniques to resist peer pressure. Uh, this is more than the just say no, like actually like Okay, well, how do we deal with that in a real situation? Uh, environmental strategies like establishing school management and disciplinary programs that deter crimes, such as locker searches. Obviously, there's a gray area on locker searches. We'll talk about that here in just a second. But there's also the therapeutic where we treat youths who have already manifested problems, but we go, you know what? Let's, let's figure this out. Let's walk through it. And so, <sighs> locker searches. Are they okay? Are they a violation of your privacy? Yes and no. So, uh, only because, you know, you're adult students in college, you don't really have to worry about this, but if you were ever in high school and be like, that's against the rules or you're going against my rights, technically speaking, when you are in the school, they have the right to search your locker uh, they don't really need a probable cause. <clears throat> That's part of what they are allowed because they are the institution that is responsible for your well-being. So they can technically do that. Um, but obviously, you know, they can't just do anything. There are some rules. But so uh, on top of those kinds of strategies for making a school a better place, uh, one thing that I do want to just briefly mention, it's not really talked about in the textbook 
but I do want to bring it up. And now it's doing the weird thing again. Every time. I think I got it, and then something happens. All right. Um, so I want to just briefly bring up after-school programs. So in case you're not familiar, uh, there are these things called after-school programs, and they sometimes seem ridiculous, but they actually do some good. Uh, so some after-school programs are for uh, individuals who are unable to uh, leave school at a certain time. Sometimes they're there for uh, to prevent students from potentially getting involved in delinquent activities. Um, but the idea is after the school bell ends, the school day is over, um, there are programs that the school or other community groups put on that would act in a similar way, and the goal is to reduce the chance for delinquency. Uh, these can be run through, like, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, sometimes a school themselves. Like, the idea is that they're offering more structure and more support for individuals to help alleviate that kind of <clears throat> impact on juvenile delinquency. So it's important to at least bring them up. So, <sighs> one last thing that I have to talk about in this, and I will be honest, this does not, this will be like a one question on an exam, because this is mostly related to your college uh, information, but I need to talk about FERPA. So the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act is what FERPA stands for. Um, FERPA is your legal rights as a student that your educational records are not public information. No random person can come in and say, hey, I want to know about this person's class schedule. What are they taking? Nobody can do that. According to FERPA, no random person can come in and ask for that. They can't get that information. The, you as a student can allow certain individuals to have access to that information. So <clears throat> if you say, oh, hey, my, let's say you are <clears throat> 22 and you're taking classes now and you make your parents a FERPA approved person because you know yourself you struggle sometimes so you need someone to kind of like watch your butt and say hey are they actually attending class you could verify that your parent is FERPA approved and so they could say hey is my child going to class and then as long as they're approved an individual could say yes your child is going to class or no they're not really FERPA is designed to give students the freedom of who can access your educational record, your educational information. Um, it's your way. Uh, you are protected in the legal landscape of school um, and control, but it is a minefield. It is dangerous. It is full of so many different things, but FERPA is your protection as a student, as a college student. So that's why I said FERPA is not going to be something that I put on a major exam or anything. It'll be like a one question, a real easy thing. And I might just say, what does FERPA stand for? Which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, which you can look up and it'll tell you that. Like, it's important to know as a college student, it doesn't have real bearing on our discussion. It is mentioned in our textbook briefly, um, but I wanted to bring it up so that you understood what it means for you. All right. I rambled too much. Um, that's chapter nine. Uh, like I said, we're going to put all four chapters together. So uh, next lecture, chapter 10, uh, part four of this week's lectures is going to be all on drug use, in parentheses, abuse, and uh, the impact that it has on delinquency rates, 
Um, so, and then we'll kind of in that go brief overview of the whole thing. So I'll see you in the last one.